I'm Beth Howard, and I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our speaker. Donald A. Raykow is an associate professor in the Cornell School of Integrative Plant Science and the former executive director of Cornell Botanic Gardens. And if you're here tonight, I think you probably know why the Cornell Botanic Gardens is no longer referred to as the Cornell Plantations. But it was when Don was director there. <laughs> Don directs the Nature Rx at Cornell program, and he conducts research on the human benefits of time in nature for all people. So take it away, Don. So um, as Beth mentioned in her introductory remarks, I conduct research on the human benefits of time in nature. And there is today an enormous body of work that confirms that being active in nature or even sitting passively in nature or based on a couple of studies, even viewing nature out a window can provide a number of short-term health benefits that can provide um, impact over a number of years. Among these benefits are a reduction in stress, anxiety, depression, a lowering of blood pressure and salivary cortisol levels, and improvements in everything from concentration to memory recall, sleep patterns, and even based on a couple of recent studies, lifespan. But we are an increasingly urban, urbanized species with, as a result, diminishing access to wild, unfettered nature. In fact, approximately four fifths of all US residents now live in urban and suburban areas, which is quite a contrast to what we were demographically back in the 19th century. So this raises, in my mind, a really fundamental question about where green spaces are located and who has the best access to them. I want to talk about redlining, which for those of you who are not familiar with the term, was an overtly racist mortgage approval process that denied loans to residents of neighborhoods primarily made up of people of color. Uh, there were a number of colors, different colors on the map that is, um, and areas that were predominantly made up of black and Latinx people or Asian American people were given the red line designation and those people would be denied mortgages. Mounting evidence indicates that these historically red line neighborhoods contributed to worth, worsen health outcomes, as well as elevated levels of air pollution, noise pollution, and exposure to environmental toxins. We'd like to think that the fair housing laws of the 1960s passed in the Johnson administration corrected the inequities of racist redlining. But a recent study by Nardone and colleagues, and you can see the citation there, found that neighborhoods that were redlined 70 to 80 years ago still lack green space today. To assess specifically how prevalent this is today, a relatively new organization called Nature Quant has developed really innovative technology tools that allow them to quantify the presence and quality of natural elements at any location in the US. 
they issued a white paper this March that summarizes their data that was collected in over 217,000 urban census block groups. And they included in their algorithms, park space and features, open water, tree canopy, uh, level of noise, and air and light pollution. And they synthesized all that data to come up with overall what they call nature scores. This graph really shows how affected uh, persons of color living in previously redlined neighborhoods um, have been impacted in terms of nature score. As you can see, when looking at the percent of persons of color, um, essentially, uh, when there are under 50% people of color, the typical nature score is almost 75%. When it's over 50%, it's down to 44. Um, similarly, looking at income, 68% for um, over, excuse me, under 50%, 32% for over 50% low income. And we see a very similar pattern for those who have had little high school education. Looking specifically at nature access scores for people of color, the nature score correlation analysis revealed really significant inequities as the percent of people of color in a neighborhood rises, there was a statistically significant lowering of nature scores based on all of those parameters that I mentioned a moment ago. Less green streets are hotter, and that's because trees are not absorbing solar radiation and shading sidewalks. This trend was verified in a recent New York Times expose titled Why an East Harlem Street is 31 degrees hotter than Central Park West. And the subhead really tells it all. If you want to map inequality in New York City, you can just count the trees. Not only is there a correlation between percent of tree cover and street level heat indices, but a recent meta-analysis of prior studies verified that a high level of greenness around a residence is associated with longer lifespans. And that is a study done by Gascon et al residential green space and mortality, a systematic review. So as I've said, when neighborhoods were uh, redlined, there were not mortgages made available, there were not street trees being planted, and the most polluting industries tended to be cited in those red line neighborhoods. So in addition to the other problems that I've cited, often these neighborhoods have the worst air quality and the most, the highest incidence rates of asthma and other air related diseases. As if all of those problems were not glaring enough. We now know based on new research done by Eric Spotswood of the San Francisco Estuary Institute that communities with predominantly people of color typically have, as I've been saying, less access to green space and get this higher COVID-19 infection rates. Spotswood and colleagues found that even a modest increase of greening 
was correlated with a 4% reduction in COVID rates in their statistical models. And I want to specifically thank Kathy Hopkins for pointing out this research that was done by Carl Hopkins' niece. So thank you, Kathy. Compounding all of these health and environmental justice shortcomings with neighborhoods where impoverished and people of color live, we also know that young people of color spend less time engaging in nature than their white counterparts. And there have been a number of studies that have verified this. One by Burunda uh, called how nature deprived neighborhoods impact the health of people of color. Um, another one called YOC youth of color are especially underrepresented in nature and their participation in nature outdoor opportunities has been steadily declining for decades. And a third one provocatively titled it all used to be better, different generations on continuity and change in urban children's daily use of outdoor space. So all of these factors that I have been sharing with you motivated a colleague of mine at William and Mary, Dorothy Ebis and I, to develop a research project built around the question, what, is, what are the primary barriers that are keeping young people of color from making greater use of parks and green spaces? Um, so we had, when starting out this research project, two primary goals to identify and quantify common barriers to youth of color visiting parks and other natural sites. And then once having identified those barriers, developing and disseminating a set of best practices based on our findings for engaging youth of color in parks and natural sites in authentic and meaningful ways. And we're very pleased that our research paper um, has been accepted and will be in the January issue of the journal Children, Youth, and the Environment. So briefly, the way that we conducted this research was initially to interview community leaders in five urban centers, both in upstate New York and in uh, Virginia, and then to follow up those interviews with community leaders by interviewing leaders from five nature sites that have successfully engaged young people of color in nature connections. And those sites were located in New York, Maryland, DC, and Virginia. In the interview questions, we asked the natural um, site leaders, um, is there a structure or set of steps you apply to support successful engagement with this target population? And we asked community leaders, what do you feel are the primary impediments to youth of color spending more time in parks or nature sites or green spaces in general, or impediments to interacting more with nature in your community? Based on the results of all of those interviews, we found that the barriers fell into three broad categories, which we termed external, uh, representing tangible impediments 
to nature engagement, psychological um, having to do with young people's psychological state, including opinions, emotions, attitudes, and then socioeconomic barriers that we defined as having to do with um, how the society was preventing these young people from greater engagement. So going into those barriers in a bit more detail, um, the specific external barriers that we saw and the numbers you see parenthetically are the frequency with which each barrier was cited uh, based on the 18 interviews. The number one external barrier was accessibility. Things like there wasn't any nearby nature or parks nearby, or there were really restrictive development patterns located between residents and nearest park. And those could be anything from housing development, um, frequently people cited highways, um, parks that are gated, or a lack of transportation. Also, um, a number, actually 12 of the 18 interviews, indicated that the youth they work with feel that there's just insufficient programming or facilities or even staff at the parks that are available. Um, eight of the 18 cited degraded environments at the parks like litter and graffiti and broken glass. Scheduling was another problem. Weather, of course, does come up, although only five of the 18 interviewees mentioned that. Policies was mentioned by a few, um, and then specific health concerns was mentioned by one individual. Moving from those external barriers to the psychological, the number one psychological barrier was fear. Perceived or actual dangers for safety from other people, from the unknown, or from the possibility of accidental injury. Um, another big psychological barrier that we need to face is preference, a lack of interest in nature-based activities um, or preference for other activities such as sports or internet use or other hobbies. And then finally, um, seven of the 18 simply mentioned an aversion to nature discomfort being around plants or animals or getting dirty or um, fear of insects is frequently cited. And then finally, the socioeconomic barriers, um, social exclusion, um, cultural or familial attitudes toward nature. Uh, we don't do nature. Um, was something that frequently came out. Um, or a sense of segregation. Oh, those parks are for white folks. Or a sense of gentrification. Um, language barriers came out a number of times. Or overall feelings of just not being welcomed in parks. Um, in some cases, um, the interviewees indicated that the young people they work with lack the resources to participate, either in terms of time or money or information or knowledge. Uh, that goes along with a lack of exposure, not really being made aware of the benefits of nature in school uh, or with adults. And then finally, um, Many of the youth these leaders work with need to focus on after school jobs, caring for siblings, or other basic necessities. As I mentioned, 
we followed up the interviews with the community leaders by interviewing um, individuals who are running nature serving sites that are successful in attracting and keeping youth of color in their programming. So a few of the best practices that we have identified through those follow-up interviews, there really needs to be an institutional and agency commitment. You know, many um, organizations and institutions are jumping on the what we call the DEI bandwagon today, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But talking the talk really needs to be followed by walking the walk. There needs to be an institutional commitment to engage with more ethnically and racially diverse communities on the part of the board, the administration, the staff, in the mission statement, in the values of the organization. Um, and the staff who are hired need to be able to relate to the youth of color who they are trying to cultivate. Secondly, it's critical to form valuable and lasting partnerships, partnerships with organizations within the community, such as government agencies, community block association, businesses, philanthropic organizations, and religious youth groups and schools. Through these partnerships, each participant um, can bring their greatest resources to the fore so that the cumulative effect is synergistic and the overall program has a greater impact than it would if each partner was working individually. Thirdly, meet youth where they are. It's great to attract young people to a nature site uh, because of the facilities and programs that are already established there. But sometimes the types of barriers I was describing earlier are simply too great to have young people come on a regular basis. Sometimes you need the, to bring the program to where the young people are. Schools, after school programs, church basements, et cetera. Also design your programs based on research with members of the community, including the young people, find out what they really want and what will appeal to them. And finally, um, find ways of attracting and offering an authentic welcoming of youth of color. When marketing, don't use old fashioned marketing methods but rather when marketing to youth of color, use social media, blogs, and other IT approaches. If it's parents that the group is trying to reach, use radio, uh, community-based outlets, church newsletters. And also, so importantly, increase financial access to programming. And that's, uh, again, where partnerships can be so helpful. So in addition to all these best practices that I've just been describing, we just need more parks in urban areas. When there are a greater number of parks and the parks are well cared for, young people flock to them. There's a bill that is currently languishing in our Congress titled the Parks, Jobs, and Equity Act. This bill, if enacted, would direct the Department of the Interior to, quote, support park development and delivery of recreational services, and in so doing, help create or preserve jobs and provide economic stimulus 
in communities impacted by COVID-19, unquote. It would give priority to creating parks in under-resourced communities. We need to ask our representatives in Congress to support bills like this one. Another component of my work on nature equity involves increasing awareness of resources that are currently available. My colleague, Laura Brown at the University of Connecticut and I have created something we call the Anti-Racism in the Outdoors or Areto Guide. It's divided into individual sections on organizations, presentations and podcasts, affinity groups and resources, articles and reports, and training and taking action. This screenshot uh, shows just a few of the more than 50 organizations that we profile on the site. Uh, the Center for Diversity and the Environment, Black Adventuristas, Black Girls Run, and the list goes on and on. And that's just the organization listing of the total resources that we include on the site. The Areto Guide is now housed on the Joy Trip Project website, which is curated by the amazing journalist, outdoorsman, and advocate, James Edward Mills, who you see way over on the left on this photo. James is a remarkable individual um, who is constantly advocating for providing full access to the outdoors for all people. And James is no casual stroller through parks. He leads mountaineering trips, uh, both in good weather and as you can see here um, in snow and ice. He gave a wonderful lecture here at Cornell a few years ago about the first and ultimately unsuccessful all black um, effort to summit Everest. So a book that I recommend to learn more about this complex topic is Black Faces, White Spaces by Carolyn Finney. Um, although it's a bit dated now, it was written several years ago, um, and I find it especially dated in relation to diversity in the staffing of the National Park Service. The book does detail ways in which Black people have been and continue to be excluded from our parks and nature sites. Access and enjoyment of nature should be a fundamental right of all people. What I've tried to outline in this presentation is ways that barriers can be identified and overcome so that every person, regardless of ethnicity, racial identity, um, sexual orientation, or uh, mobility, will feel that nature welcomes them and helps them heal. So that's the end of my formal remarks. I'm going to stop sharing, and then I would be happy to try to answer any questions anyone may have. Maybe at this point, we could ask if people would turn their cameras back on so we can see who we have with us. Sam Weeks, did you have your hand up? You're muted, Sam.
Still not hearing you, Sam. No, we still can't hear you. You tried turning your volume up. Yeah. Um, Russ, can you um, tell Sam in the chat maybe how to get his audio configured? And while they're working on that, perhaps we can take another take question. Somebody else's question, yeah. Please. Ruth, go ahead. Thank you for your work, Don. Um, when I, uh, many years ago, uh, taught at Schuylkill Valley Nature Center in Philadelphia, it was helpful to have um, a black teacher, a male, work with me um, so that the kids had someone to relate to. And we invented a program called LEAP, which was uh, linking uh, urban environments with the, with the nature center. So we looked for food webs in the vacant lots and then we brought them out to the nature center. And that was very helpful. Um, when I taught at Cuga Nature Center here, I noticed that GIAC and Southside had a really well-developed thing where kids could enter and gradually go up into more and more responsible positions and eventually become counselors. And uh, I tried to get that going at Cayuga Nature Center. We did have uh, one young black woman become a counselor, but we didn't have that entry that really cultivating young people looking up to their, the next older kids and realizing that there was a stairway for them to become involved. And I think that's an important thing to include, maybe that's in some of your best practices, but it seemed to me really key. Thanks so much for those comments, Ruth, and good to see you. Um, I completely agree that it is often most successful when counselors and other leaders at nature sites are themselves people of color. Um, because um, it can permit the audience that they're trying to work with um, to feel more comfortable, uh, to feel more welcomed, and to relate more quickly. Um, here in Ithaca, we have some wonderful programs. You mentioned uh, GIAC. Uh, I would also cite the programs at the Ithaca Children's Garden, which have done an extraordinary job of attracting and engaging um, young people of color and, and all young people. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I saw that other people had their hands up. Harry, you had your hand up. Did you change your mind? <laughs> Well, Don answered my question before I could ask it. I was, I was wondering how Ithaca, with all its green space, was doing with youth of color, and it appears we're doing quite well. Hmm. Well, I think we could always do better. I think we could do much better, but I really do applaud uh, the programs at GIAC and Southside and Ithaca Children's Garden. Um, I am part of a group which is hoping to um, have the city of Ithaca designated as a biophilic city. And that would then um, mandate that the city uh, meet a number of metrics for improving green space access for all of its residents. Great. Ruth, did you have another question or have you, oh, do you know sorry, how to lower your hand? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, you seem to have a comment or question. 
I had my real hand rub. I forgot how to do the <laughs> yellow one. Um, I, this the story reminds me of an apartment we lived in in New York City in 2012 when Carl was on sabbatical there, and it had, was in the Upper West Side, which when we li originally lived there in the 60s was the scariest place in the world. Nobody yeah. ever wanted to go, <laughs> and um, but the community there, the literally the lot next to where we, our apartment building had the the neighborhood grabbed that lot and made the city give it to them and turn it into a park. It's got gardens in it, um, you know, food food places where people can plant their own gardens. You have to, it's a waiting list to get on to have a food plot and also to get to be a gardener in where all the, <laughs> all the flowers are. And it, it, it just is a beautiful part of the history from that community of course, now the Upper West Side, nobody can afford to live there anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, the, this park started way before that. It was just a good, good. The, the city didn't know what to do with this, the building. And yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Kathy. I have a couple of thoughts in response. Um, one is that the community gardening movement in cities around the U.S has been phenomenally successful. And in fact, in New York, um, during the Giuliani administration, there was a major thrust to dispossess a number of the community gardens and some very well-heeled and well-known individuals, including Bette Midler, um, fought the Giuliani administration on that and won. And the great majority of those community gardens have been able to persist. Um, another research project that colleagues and I from um, ESF in Syracuse um, conducted over the past year or so was how did COVID-19 affect people's community gardening practices. What we found is that um, in the cities where we collected data, it did not diminish community gardening at all. In fact, a number of people uh, joined community gardens for the first time, but it definitely did impact practices where people were not permitted to congregate in crowds and people had to uh, sign up for specific times, et cetera. Uh, David, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to always let Kathy go first. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Don, first of all, for a really great uh, enlightening talk occasionally depressing at least to me um the, the whole issue of accessibility and or really this issue of it's not my space that 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 nature is for or green space or parks are for white people is is one of the saddest things i've heard in a while uh, but it also makes perfect sense but anyhow i guess i, I so um the question i want to ask though <laughs> is um you know, gardens, parks, green space, nature, those are four really different things to me. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering like how important each one is or, or, or whatever, you know, like it would seem, I would guess that accessibility would be hardest to get to nature. That's true for everybody, I think. But I guess I'm wondering in your research and your experience, you know, how important is that kind of the, you know, wild, the more wild, the better, or any green is better than no green. Like just talk to us a little bit about that, those distinctions and how important they are or how, the differences in accessibility that might play out in those different uh, locations. Great question, David. And it's a question that I'm often asked in one form or another. And my typical response is nature is what a person thinks it is. So there have been a number of studies that have shown that the same benefits of reduction of stress and anxiety 
and depression and ability to enhance concentration can be achieved when walking through a botanic garden like Cornell Botanic Gardens than walking through a natural forest. Uh, there have been studies that have shown very similar benefits uh, to spend two hours in a backyard garden to spending equal amount of time um, in that same unfettered forest. So um, although organizations like this nature quant that I mentioned toward the beginning of my talk are really trying for the first time to quantify and qualify nature sites. We know based on a lot of research that's been done that one can access the natural world in many different types of settings. I often say, if a student is walking along Power Road and they're looking up at those oak trees and they see one of those red tail hawks performing in the tree, that's a, that's a, a, a true nature experience, even if there's a bus going by on the road. Don, I have a question. Um, following up on everything you just said, what about um, nature programming in very urban environments? For example, I'm thinking of um, the program that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology does on celebrating urban birds where they have kids in schools, I think it is, study pigeons or you know, whatever happens to be in their environment. I mean, I'm picturing a teacher taking kids outside and looking at anthills in the sidewalk, you know, or things like that, where they're, they're actually seeing the natural world, but in an area that there may not be anything green or growing for blocks around. Well, as the Gentlemen uh, sitting next to you know, um, the Lab of Ornithology has some extraordinary um, urban birding programs. Um, and I really applaud them for that. More broadly, I really am of the belief that even in Midtown Manhattan, even in the South Bronx, there is nature to be seen. Yes, these red line neighborhoods were terribly underrepresented in terms of tree plantings and availability of mortgages and, and all that that includes. But even in those terribly under-resourced neighborhoods, there is nature to be seen, not only pigeons, but sparrows and crows and other common urban species in the trees. And there are trees, even in our most urbanized sites. Mm -hmm. And you can learn a lot from a tree. For sure. Barbara. Uh, I was wondering in your barriers uh, discussion, you're talking about young people, but are you talking to the families or adults so that they become excited about green spaces? So um, kind of a two-part answer to that good question, Barbara. In that specific study, we were not talking to the parents or guardians of the youth, um, but we do know that it's absolutely essential that the whole family structure um, be supportive of young people spending time in nature and that the younger the age that the um, individual is exposed to nature, the more impact it has on them. In fact, there are some great studies that show that those um, individuals who are exposed to nature before the age of 10 are most likely to make time in nature part of their lives as they go into teenagehood and then young adulthood. So absolutely families need to be involved. 
Joanne and then Ed. Um, <clears throat> this ties into exactly what um, Don was just talking about, but I wanted to mention that um, within the Ithaca City School District, uh, K through five grades, and then in Trumansburg, Newfield and Dryden, also K through five, um, all of those students go on a field trip um, and each grade goes to a different spot that's in the discovery trail. But two of the areas that they go to are the lab of ornithology mm -hmm. and the botanical gardens. And what's lovely about that is they also get a book um, that they can take home with them. Um, there's a bookmark that, that goes home to the parents so that they know they've gone on the trip. Um, they actually get for the lab of, oh, they get the Peterson guide for birds. And um, so it's really quite wonderful that all of these students get to participate in those field trips and experience the wonderful things that are available in our area. Um, again, all of the elementary schools in the Ithaca City School District, Newfield, Dryden, and Trumansburg also get to participate. So um, there's some wonderful things going on. They also go to like the uh, Museum of the Earth, the Cayuga Nature Center, um, the Science Center, and uh, the Eight Square Schoolhouse. So some And really the Public awesome. Library. And the Public Library, and the Johnson Museum of Art. And the Johnson Museum, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, did we get all eight? <laughs> Yes, I think so. And I, I just want to add, too, that, um, you know, you had mentioned taking the program to where the youth are. And I think that's another strength. As, as Don knows, as many of you know, I work at the Botanic Garden. So um, and we do um, our kids discover the trail program is around uh, discovering wildflowers, wildflower explorations. So the kids do come to uh, the Monday Wildflower Garden for a field trip. But as also as part of that program, as part of all the materials that they get, um, they also get an in-classroom lesson. So prior to their field trip, we have um, uh, facilitators that go into the schools and into the classroom um, to kind of uh, do a lesson with them and also prepare them for their visit. So I think that's, and this also kind of reflects back on David's question about uh, the type of location and uh, uh, type of facility and accessibility because I do think that it is, it's definitely possible to have a really high quality nature experience in a botanic garden. Um, we do have also many natural areas too, but even uh, if we didn't, I think, you know, even in a formal garden, you can have a high quality nature experience, provided that the garden is in a place that people can get to. And I think that is, um, I think that's one of the challenges we have as I think we're, you know, we do our best to be an extremely accessible garden. We have no gate, we have no admission fee, um, but we're physically located up on the hill on the Cornell campus, which makes it a challenge for uh, for residents of the city and for youth in the city to, uh, to get to our space. So I do think that uh, having those outreach programs that, that can actually go into the school as well as, as bringing them to the site are really crucially important. Well, at least um, you're not 50 minutes away from downtown Chicago as the Chicago Botanic Garden is. Absolutely, that's true, very true. So Joanne, thank you for speaking about Kids Discover the Trail and Kevin, thank you for those additional comments. Beth, I think we have time for one more question and I'm hoping that Sam's audio is now working. But he's... he's Muted. Sam, you're, you're still, muted you're now. You're still muted. <laughs> he was unmuted for a while. There, there. you go. There you go. We're still not uh, hearing we you. We still can't hear you, Sam. I'm sorry. Sam, if... Hmm. Huh. Oh, uh, boy. I'm not sure what the problem is. Sam, I'll have to get in touch with you myself and, and see if I can answer your question offline. Bef 
Be before we wrap up, though, Don, um, I Ed Nizolowski also had his hand up. Do, could we take oh, sure. his question oh, instead? Yeah, if I could jump in. Um, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to do with you know children of color, but about six weeks ago, I read in the Binghamton paper that at Letchworth State Park, they had opened up an interactive area that was aimed at children who are autistic. And that certainly has to do with um, providing more equity and access in that regard. So that was that was pretty exciting. I haven't had a chance to see exactly what they've developed there, but uh, it was quite exciting to see that. Now I came in late and uh, something I wanted to, to bring up from a historical perspective, many of our environmental icons had some really deep prejudicial attitudes. Uh, John Muir has come under criticism. Uh, I've read a lot of John Burroughs. When he went to Alaska, he said, you know, the natives are better off working in a fish factory than doing what they normally do to provide for themselves. Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, just recently, there, there, there's a, a few organizations, um, you know, uh, that are connected to Audubon. And one of them said, we're removing his name because we found out how horrible he felt towards African-Americans. So uh, have those historical attitudes played into, you know, why people of color have not embraced the outdoors the way they should have? I think that's absolutely true. And I think that it is very overdue that we are re-examining the attitudes and statements by these environmental icons. At the same time, I feel that we cannot dismiss their achievements. Um, so I think we have to look both at achievements and racist and uh, derogatory uh, approaches that they had had. Um, someone just asked, what about Frederick Law Olmsted? I've read an extensive biography of Olmsted, a wonderful book called Clearing in the Distance. And I don't believe at any point Olmsted expressed publicly, at least, uh, racist or uh, demeaning attitudes toward others. Well, I know that unfortunately our time is out. Uh, I would have loved to have been able to answer additional questions. Look forward to seeing all of you at future coffee hours. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Don. Don. Thanks for that plug for coffee hour, Don. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for coming this evening and we will uh, try to provide additional programs of this general sort. <laughs>